I'm going to talk about integrative health today and going to share some thoughts. Really, a presentation that I've been evolving over the last year um, that came from some soul searching a little bit around why do I do what I do and really what is this integrative health and why is it now becoming uh, more and more not only prevalent but um, really uh, the topic of interest from various settings within healthcare. Uh, we're going to talk about what I consider to be some of the core principles or tenets of integrative medicine. I'm going to talk more about the role of integrative health uh, within our changing U.S. healthcare system and, and then ultimately make this a little more personal, I think, and, and something that will apply to uh, certainly the patients that we care for, but also for ourselves in terms of how we would influence someone's health trajectory, and I'm going to talk more about that. Um, so integrative medicine is certainly becoming more popular and is popular, and I think that's one reason why certainly uh, the nursing profession should be familiar with it. I, I think it's a little funny to be here to present to uh, nurses and that um, in many ways the nurses have understood this stuff well before the medical staff and the physicians in terms of some of the principles of integrative health and I think some of the core principles of nursing, nursing um, I think are really very much in alignment with what I consider to be the principles of integrative health. Uh, I think, you know, Dr. Oz didn't make integrative medicine, integrative health popular. It's, it's the popularity of integrative health that has led to people like Dr. Oz popping up and Andy Weil and others. But it's not just the public. I mean, as I've already sort of implied, academic medicine, medicine in general, our healthcare system in general, has really begun to maybe embrace is a little too strong of a word, but certainly begin to integrate integrative health in, in various settings, and in many cases embrace. I think one example is uh, there is an academic consortium for integrative medicine and health. Duke was one of the founding members of that back in 1999. But that, that group has grown significantly. Uh, it, as you heard in my bio, it's now over 70 academic medical centers. So if you think of that in terms of medical schools, and it's roughly 150, give or take. So more than a third, almost a half of all academic institutions, all medical schools, have some sort of integrative program, fairly robust. And to be a member in that consortium, you need to have at least two out of three components of an integrative program, two out of three meaning research, clinical, or education, that are fairly robust in the application process. And you need your dean to be the one to actually send the letter, because they, part of the, the criteria is that you have institutional support. If you look at those institutions, certainly Duke is on the list, but it's, I think, many other institutions that, uh, you know, we would be proud to uh, be affiliated with or, um, you know, like Harvard and Johns Hopkins and, and some of the other leading, of course, after Duke, some of the other leading academic institutions in the nation. But what is integrative medicine or integrative health and what is it that people are really interested in? You know, what is this all about? As I was saying earlier, uh, you know, what is it that I'm really interested in? And I guess part of this came from some ideas of how I got to where I was at. I actually got interested in integrative medicine through a background in martial arts. So when I was younger, I did martial arts for many years, actually, started when I was 16. Owned a school for a while back in Massachusetts where I grew up, and um, I was still going to school while I was doing that, but really loved seeing people get healthier. It wasn't about the kick and punch. I mean, I was teaching Tai Chi and things like that. And, and I also got exposed to East Asian philosophy, and I kind of wondered why we didn't integrate more of that into the conventional system. So that was really a big part of my motivation to, into going to medical school. And, and, but still, you know, it was really just a couple of years ago, I felt like, well, here I was at Duke, and I feel like I've had a really blessed career and really enjoy the things I'm doing here at Duke. And I still kind of felt like my parents have no idea what I do. Like, you know, what is this integrative stuff? And, uh, they, you know, and so, Part of what I'm going to present to you is really some of my thoughts and talking with colleagues and others around you know, what it is that integrative medicine is all about. Uh, obviously on the, on the left here is the Duke Wheel of Health. These are sort of the three main principles that I think about when I think about integrative medicine. I'm always careful to say I actually did grand rounds, uh, medicine grand rounds just a few weeks ago and you know, um, I'm always careful to say that I don't believe integrative medicine owns these principles, right? but that these are sort of concepts that for many of us who have been interested in integrative medicine, these are concepts that have really resonated with us. And then for me personally, it's, it's what gets me excited about what I do in healthcare. 
The first one is this idea of placing the patient at the center. And what does that really mean? Now we talk a lot about patient-centered care in you know, healthcare, obviously, not something that creative medicine owns. I would say that when I hear these conversations, to me sometimes it's like when you hear the world wellness or well-being. You know, people use it, I'm never quite sure what they're talking about. I think, you know, we kind of mean the same thing and there's a great deal of overlap, but we have our own ideas about what that might mean. And I feel the same way about patient-centered care. And, and, you know, I guess for me, the way I define it is really person-centered care. And what it means for me is that when I think about, you know, a patient, someone like Mike here, who might be a diabetic, might have chronic pain, maybe has hypertension, all things that I need to uh, treat, um, that if really I want to be patient-centered or person-centered, what I really need to do is take those labels off of Mike, right? I mean, certainly I need to work hard to get his hemoglobin A1C where it needs to be or his blood pressure, but to be truly person or patient-centered, I need to understand Mike and understand that he's a husband, that he, he loves to run, that he loves to play with his dog, may, maybe play with his grandkids, and that those are the things that are particularly important to him. Those are the values, those are the goals that are most important. And then in some ways, getting that hemoglobin A1C into a normal range is just a means to an end to allow him to be able to do those things more in his life. And if he can understand that, then he will become more engaged in that plan of care, right? He will see the need to manage his weight and eat better and take his medications. He'll see that in a much different light if he understands that that's what he needs to do, not just to get some lab value back to normal, but to actually be able to have the energy to play fire trucks with his granddaughter and get back up again, right? And so we talk about patient engagement. A lot of it is really referring to that kind of a relationship with patients and that kind of an understanding. The next piece is what most people, in my mind, tend to think about when they think about integrative medicine. And certainly for my almost 20 years of doing this, you know, that's what I tend to get associated with, which is this idea of what I like to call as an inclusive approach, but the idea of including complementary and alternative medicine in an overall plan of care. And I would say really taking an evidence-based approach to sort of broadening the therapeutic options available uh, you know, in that regard, I've spent much, if not most, of my career trying to study, in many cases, do the research, uh, but certainly study the research and understand the evidence for many of the things out there that would fall under this category of complementary and alternative medicine. But I've never felt like I'm the spokesperson for that, right? I mean, I felt like I'm open to it. I've been very curious about it. I've spent a lot of time reading a lot of studies and trying to understand how it gets integrated into an overall plan of care how it might be appropriate for the care of our patients, how it might be appropriate for the care of us, right? And that's sort of part of what my message is going to be today, too, um, that, you know, a big part of what needs to happen is care for the caretaker. And then in looking at that, you know, how might this inclusive approach apply to all of us? And then finally, in many ways, this final one is the piece that's resonated the most with me personally and kind of gets me the most excited about what I do in, in, in health and in healthcare. And this idea of not perhaps simply trying to treat disease, but really focusing on health optimization. How do we help people to truly thrive to the best of their abilities in their lives and not feel satisfied perhaps when we get that hemoglobin A1C back into a normal range or blood pressure because we know that doesn't mean that Mike has the energy or Mary to play with their grandkids or do whatever they want to do in life. And can we see our role as helping people to be able to do that? You know, with that in mind, I kind of said, well, maybe the goal of an integrative approach, and as I read this more and more, it's sort of like maybe the goal of healthcare could be to implement and assess, because we want to study these things, successful methodologies that transform the health trajectory of the individual, the community, and the healthcare system. So what do I mean by health trajectory? Well, we all have a health trajectory, right? We could think of it this way. It begins and it ends at the same place. And I know for me, and I would venture for hopefully all of us here, you know, we'd like this to be a very long journey, as long as possible, but of course, we want the best quality of life throughout that journey, right? I mean, I want to be doing all I can do and then maybe on the last day just sort of dive in, right? When you look at health trajectories in healthcare in general, we look more broadly, they can be a little bit scary. So, you know, this is a little dated, but it still applies what we spend on healthcare, and of course, you know, 
for all the money we're spending, we're typically rated where? 30, 34, somewhere around that when you look at industrialized nations. So, you know, are we really getting a good bang for our buck? But in many areas, we're clearly the, uh, the best. But in, in markers of quality of care, I mean, things you'd be surprised with, right? Things like infant and maternal mortality. I mean, that, you know, that's, those kind of things that would bring down our overall rating and, and um, a little scared to think about. This is uh, from the Centers for Disease Control. This is how successful we've been in trying to stir, uh, turn back the tide of diabetes uh, over the last few years. Think about all that's happened. Um, and here's one that's a little bit scary too. It relates to obesity. Number of things going on here probably. I always like to point out 1980 and not be overly political, but ask if you don't mind, what kind of things were happening in around 1980 that might have led, might have led to this spike. Any thoughts? Oh, don't be shy. It's a small, intimate group here. What was it? Fast food. Fast food, something related to fast foods. So, well, no. Uh, pr related to that too, probably. What made those things inexpensive? So right around there, we have a farm bill that subsidized corn. And with the subsidization of corn, we saw a lot of high fructose corn syrup entering the marketplace, um, and we see a spike. Now, of course, more recently, as someone else pointed out to me, around the same time is probably around the time that the uh, sugar industry, apparently, from some of the articles that we've all read recently, was able to manipulate things and make fat the culprit uh, in our diets uh, and sort of suppress some of the data looking at sugar and the relationship between sugar and heart disease. Um, and of course, as fat became the culprit, we began to substitute fat with carbohydrates that probably has contributed both to the obesity and the diabetes spike. It's interesting, I always like to tell this story that my father-in-law, who has passed away a number of years ago, he's a, a, a great man, big-hearted man, uh, worked for Mack Truck his whole life, spray-painted, they didn't use the mask, smoked, uh, developed some uh, uh, COPD, finally quit smoking, put on, you know, 40, 50 pounds, as many people do, and uh, subsequently developed pulmonary hypertension and a number of things, but just prior to that, he was trying to lose some of the weight that he had put on. And I, I walked in, and this is probably, this is quite a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I walk in, and he's at his kitchen table and he's eating a bunch of those, I think they were like the snack wells cookies, they were like low-fat cookies, I said, low-fat? And I see he's got a package right in front of him. And, and I go, Dad, what, what are you doing? And he goes, well, look, low fat. And I grabbed like the sugar jar they had on like the kitchen counter. And I said, like, there's no fat in this. Like, would you eat that whole thing too, you know? And so people were really fooled by a lot of the information that's out there. It's really unfortunate. So I'll get off of that soapbox and get back to my presentation. But, you know, it's a little scary to see where, we've, where we're going now. And of course, uh, actually the grand rounds I gave the other day and um, have given a, f a few times now is, is more on uh, non-medication integrative approaches to complex pain. Um, that's not this talk, but this is one of the slides I used in this talk. And this could say, this does say use of opioid pain relievers. It actually could be overdoses as well. And the, and this, and the line looks uh, pretty much the same. Uh, and I think some recent data I saw just this week I think uh, drug overdoses are at all-time high. Some new data just came out. It was, if not this week, it was early. It was last week uh, as well. So kind of scary stuff going on there. But of course, at the end of the day, for those that we care for, whether it's our patients, our family members, most assuredly for our, ourselves, we care most about our own trajectory, right? And our patients care about their trajectory. And what's it going to look like for us? So. How do you really influence some, someone's trajectory? I mean, if you think back to the mic thing, I mean, part of it is getting the hemoglobin A1Cs back to normal and the blood pressures. But if we really want to think about it in that broader sense, in that health optimization sense, or in that patient-centered, person-centered approach, you really need to know the person. I mean, Hippocrates understood this, you know, whatever, 5,000 years ago. That you need to understand what's important to them. You need to have that conversation and really know that. So really, part of what I want, I hope all of you would take away from today's lecture is that 
part of what integrative medicine is, or maybe part of what it isn't, what it isn't is substituting St. John's Wort for Prozac. Like that's not, oh, now I'm integrative because I didn't take the Prozac, I bought the St. John's Wort. Uh, that's just substituting one pill for, a for another one. Integrative at its core is really about a different approach to care. And again, not an approach that I would claim integrative medicine owns, right? And I think increasingly, I think, you know, the nursing profession has understood this, you know, uh, forever. And I think increasingly uh, on the medical side, the, you know, we're beginning to appreciate uh, the importance of taking a different approach. You know, and we're calling it different things. We're calling it patient-centered. We're calling it mind-body, whole person, all these different things, depending on sort of the setting. When I was thinking about this, I mean, something sort of occurred to me, too. And thinking about what sort of gets me excited about integrative health and this approach and what I do. And what I realized, and this is, again, very recent, um, that the story I've been telling, that I've told you about how I got interested in integrative health and the martial arts, and although that's true, it's not really complete. That there's a couple other aspects to the story that really sort of a why I do what I do and why I think integrative medicine is really a can and should be a big part of the future of healthcare. So the first part of the story involves my 98 year old grandmother. So I took this picture about five weeks ago now, about a week, something like this, about a week after her 98th birthday. Um, and so part of the story is I was really happy being a martial arts instructor and I thought that's what I was going to do the rest of my life. And she kind of grabbed me and said, you know, you better go find a career. So I didn't want to leave that part out because I have to give her a little bit of credit because that is true. But as I started thinking about what I like, you know, I ended up in medicine. But what I realized is that there was something like how did it relate beyond sort of this East Asian philosophy stuff to what I really find exciting about what I do now. And as I was thinking about this, I thought about this picture from probably, I think I was 19. And I asked my wife if she had the picture and she was able to find it. I hadn't seen it. In, a number of years, and I'm going to share it with you now. Okay, so uh, that is not me, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Um, yes, that's me, and, I, and I'm trying to figure out my age. I think 19, because I was the first to read Black Belt, I can see from, from the stripe down my leg. So why did I want to show this picture? First of all, I could never do this now, and if I did, you'd all be dragging me over to orthopedics grand rounds and asking them to put me back together again. Um, but for me, what got me really interested and what kept me in martial arts for 18 years was more the idea of what did it take to get here, right? Because this isn't exactly a marketable skill unless I work for Cirque du Soleil or something, right? So, but to me, it was about trying to explore potential inside of myself. You know, could I learn to do that? You know, how many hours of practice and determination, and to some degree, if I could accomplish that goal, you know, what couldn't I accomplish, right? I mean, I think I learned, use that to then say, well, you know what, I'm going to go to medical school. I decided very late, I was, I had to do all my pre-med, post-baccalaureate. So, you know, that kind of commitment and determination was what really sort of fascinated me, but again, more so this idea of on a, on a mental, on a physical level, perhaps spiritual level, you know, how can we live up to or explore this potential inside of ourselves? Kind of what I was saying earlier, right? And around the same time, I was reading an article and it referenced Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Maslow in the late 30s, early 40s talked about basic human needs, what we need. And, you know, at a very, he, he described it as sort of this pyramid and at the most basic level is our physiologic needs to eat and reproduce and then of course we need safety, we need clothes and housing and those sorts of things. Then beyond that you start to get to th into things like we need to feel loved and belong. We need to feel like we belong to a community, to our tribe. And then within that we need to have a sense of self-esteem and self-worth, this idea. But then at the very peak, right, Maslow talked about this idea of self-actualization and this idea of, uh, you know, the way I would define it of sort of exploring a potential inside of oneself. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking, wait a minute, isn't there something above self-actualization? Wouldn't it be helping others to self-actualize, right? Helping others to live up to whatever potential may exist inside of them. And I thought, 
I have just come across the greatest thing ever. And then I found that Maslow wrote about that too later in his career. But, <laughs> but I never read Maslow's article on that and I thought of it on my own, so I'm just saying. But you know, so Maslow did talk about that later in his career. And you know, really, I guess, that's what I'm sort of arguing. I actually have a paper coming out in January that, that is uh, sort of as an opinion piece suggesting that what if we saw our roles as healthcare providers, as a healthcare system, going beyond treating disease to really helping people to live up to whatever potential is inside of themselves. And that could be anyone. That doesn't mean that we all should be running marathons or doing triathlons, but how good could you feel or you feel or could I feel? Or how much, what kind of a quality of life could that individual in a wheelchair have? You know, what, what could we do? And of course, when you start to think about that, it certainly goes beyond what we might be able to do as nurses, as physicians, even as a healthcare system. And you begin to think, well, what if we partnered with other organizations in the community or other individuals that have other skill sets that might be able to contribute to that person's ability to continually explore some potential inside of themselves. And, and I'm kind of arguing in this paper that, you know, when we think about population health, and I know when I hear a lot of conversations around population health, I tend to hear we're going to do a lot better job of managing hemoglobin A1Cs and blood pressures and predicting who's at risk for developing this or that. I don't hear so much about what do we need to do to help this population to truly thrive, right? To truly thrive as a, as a community.